Hello, I'm Ross Tucker and welcome to this presentation on exercise and the immune system. I'm coming to you from Cape Town, South Africa today. I hope that wherever in the world you are, you are healthy, safe and sane in one of these very unprecedented times and looking after yourself and the communities that you are in. As I say, this is a presentation on exercise and the immune system and it had its genesis in a talk that I gave last week to some personal trainers from Virgin Active here in South Africa. So those not in the know, Virgin Active is a fitness chain, the largest in South Africa, and it's also global. And they host a number of personal trainers or PTs, and I've been involved with them for the last three or four years to try and upskill and educate those personal trainers. So I gave them a couple of talks last week on this topic, and I've then taken that and turned it into a presentation for everyone else also. So if you see me refer in this talk to clients, it's because I'm speaking to the trainers, but obviously you can just apply what I'm saying to yourself. So I'm going to share with you my screen so that we can look at this presentation together as we go through it. Uh, so slide mode. So this is exercise and immunity. And obviously I'm specifically talking about this because of COVID-19 and the lockdowns that we've all been forced into. And there are two parts to this talk. The first part, which is this video, is on exercise and the immune system. We're gonna discuss exactly how exercise affects immune function in both good and bad ways. The second part, which will be in a second video, which you'll find on the YouTube page and I'll tweet it and so on elsewhere also, is on the physiology of detraining, which is a major issue now that so many people around the world have been locked down into their homes and they can't access gym facilities. Some can't even go outside and do their normal cardio exercise, the runnings and the cycling. So we'll talk about what happens to your physiology and your fitness and performance when you are forced to stop training or to change your training drastically. And obviously the goal is to talk about mitigation and how you can prevent that loss for your clients and for yourselves. So that's where we're going. This, as I say, is just exercise and the immune system. And in that regard, there are three things, and I'm telling you this up front so that you can basically take these as the key messages of this talk that you need to know. Number one, the J-curve hypothesis, a famous theory, I'll explain what it is. Number two, the open window hypothesis, also well known, we're gonna discuss exactly why it might occur. And then third, the bit that you all wanna know about is the practical issues and the applications of these theories for exercise and infection risk. So we begin with this J-curve hypothesis. This is a very famous graph. What it shows you, I'm sure you've all seen it in some form, is the risk of a URTI, upper respiratory tract infection, which is basically what COVID-19 is, on the y-axis. And naught means normal. It doesn't mean zero risk. It means normal risk, so not greater or less than it usually would be. And what you see here is that when a person is sedentary or inactive, they have a normal risk of infection. When that person or people increase the volume and intensity of exercise so that they are doing moderate exercise, that risk drops. And so you can take this to the bank as a fact, is that regular moderate exercise reduces the risk of infection to almost half of normal. The problem is, like in so many things, you can have too much of a good thing. And so if the exercise workload goes from moderate to heavy, we see that the risk of infection then goes back up and becomes much greater than normal. And so heavy exercise increases the infection risk by between two and six fold. So what we are basically saying here, key points, number one, exercise and fitness is protective. It leads to a better immune response to antigens, things like viruses, pathogens. It produces a reduced degree of chronic inflammation, and it leads to better immune markers in disease states. So for all those reasons, exercise is good, and you should as much as possible look to keep active, keep fit, and keep training. But there becomes a point, or there comes a point rather, where excessive exercise is bad, and that can be acute or chronic, but the point is that it increases the infection risk over and above normal. So what we have here is a classic Goldilocks situation. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. It's the same for exercise and infection. Not too little, because then your risk is higher. Not too much, because then your risk can be much higher, but just somewhere in the middle. 
Now, the middle <laughs> and what's optimal for people varies tremendously based on the person and their circumstance, the environment, the context. And so I'm not going to tell you exactly how much becomes too much or too little. That's something you need to understand. There are people who could train for 10 to 15 hours a week and have no increased risk. And there are some people who can train for five and find an increased risk. So you've got to figure that point out for yourself. But the concept is that heavy exertion, and we're going to look at what that means just now, increases the risk of infection. More broadly, fitness equals health equals protection. And so creating and maintaining your health and that, that of your clients for the trainers is actually in the public health interest because it means you're less likely to be affected by an infection. So that's really important to understand. I think it's also important to understand the specifics and the nuances around this J curve. I could stop this talk right here and just leave you with that previous slide. That would be, I think, sufficient headlines. But I like, and I think it's important to understand how we know things in a little bit more detail. So that's what this is about. Now, the, the immune response to exercise, well, to any infection, consists of two components. There's an innate component shown in blue, which is nonspecific and involves various chemicals in our blood, which attack pathogens in the body. And then in green, you see what's called the adaptive immune system. So this is the antigen specific side where our bodies produce antibodies against a specific foreign substance. And then there is a memory component where we have those antibodies in future. And, and you've probably heard or read about this in the last few weeks because it's so dominant in the news. But this is, for instance, where the vaccine is going to try and target. The key for exercise is that the theory is that both components, the innate and the adaptive, are affected by exercise, though in different ways to different degrees. So let's look at the good side of exercise and immune function. When we do moderate intensity and duration exercise, and again, that moderate is a relative term. What's moderate for John might be completely different for Mike. But when we do that kind of exercise, what we know is that we have increased activation, recirculation and exchange of all the immune cells between the blood and the lymph tissue. So basically, if your immune system is a security patrol in your neighborhood, what exercise is doing is it's putting more security guards and cars and patrollers into that neighborhood more often so that you, in the end, get what's called increased immunosurveillance. In other words, the immune system is better able to monitor and therefore respond to potential infections. It also has enduring, which means they last longer than exercise, anti-inflammatory effects. And the benefits are there for many disease states and for the prevention of diseases. So that's what exercise does that is good. Enhanced immune function through activation, recirculation, exchange. As we increase the intensity and duration, remember the J-curve, what's going to happen is that heavy or vigorous prolonged exercise is going to cause immune dysfunction inflammation, which is bad, oxidative stress, which can be bad, and muscle damage, which can be bad, in varying degrees. And that's important to understand. These things, like inflammation, for instance, is crucial for how we adapt to exercise training. But too much of it, or too prolonged inflammation, becomes negative. The result of this, all these different things listed here, is that various cell functions, from the natural killer cells to the neutrophils, to the T and B cells are altered for several hours to days after intense training. And that leads us to our second hypothesis, which is called the open window hypothesis, namely that for several hours or days after we do intense prolonged exercise, the markers of immune function are generally suppressed. And so therefore there is a window, hence the name, in which we might be more vulnerable to infection as a result of training. So we train hard, we suppress immune function, we're vulnerable, and then it recovers. And that comes, or well, evidence for that comes from a number of different studies, which is questionable, by the way. Um, I'll get onto that shortly. But here's an example from an uh, ultramarathon 56K race here in Cape Town, South Africa, where about 34% of people who competed in that race reported symptoms in the two weeks after compared to only 14, 15% of people who did not. So you were twice as likely to report symptoms after running the race than not. Similar finding in a marathon in Los Angeles, this time 
about 13% of marathon runners reported symptoms compared to 2% of those who did not, which means that you were six times more likely to have symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection after running the race. Similar thing here, this is the odds of getting it or how, how much more likely you are as a function of your weekly training distance. And you can see the more you train, the greater your odds of a upper respiratory tract infection. So just to illustrate that conceptually, this is a, a graph or a diagram that I've taken from a paper by Neiman and Wentz, which you can find online, summarizing all these issues. And what they did is they compared a marathon, which is obviously a continuous, prolonged, high intensity, to a walking bike, which is shorter and lower intensity. And they're gonna look here at various things. So there's adaptive immune function and innate immune function. What you're looking at is the degree and duration of change conceptually. Notice how the dark blue for the marathon shows large negative changes in adaptive and innate immunity after the race. Whereas the walking bout in light blue shows small positive changes after it's been done. So intense prolonged exercise causes negative immune changes that are large and prolonged. At the same time, we can look at inflammation. Notice here, that the marathon causes large increases of inflammation, whereas the walking only small increases. So what we see collectively here is a shift in the balance where we've got suppressed immune function shown here combined with excessive inflammation. And so what's happening is that the body then shifts to an anti-inflammatory state with impaired immune function. The result of that, and this is the model for the open window, is that the immune system's ability to mount a response to a new infection is impaired. And so as a result, we have reduced protection against new pathogens or latent viruses. So that's open window. Now, this is contested. There is a paper um, cited here, Simpson et al. 2020, which mentions that there are conflicting views on this to be mindful of. And one of the problems is, that when we exercise and train, we tend to do exactly the opposite of social distancing. Social distancing must be the word of 2020 so far. We all know what it means because we're all forced to do it. But I think, and I don't know what the opposite of social distancing is, I've called it social closening. But the point is that when we exercise, whether it's in gyms or whether we compete in marathons, we are coming closer together, not further apart. And so there is this confounder where people who participate in races might actually be more likely to be exposed to pathogens like viruses. In addition, they have other risk factors. For example, lack of sleep. They're traveling potentially from Johannesburg to Cape Town or from Chicago to Los Angeles to run the race. There's a degree of anxiety. There might be disrupted routines. There's crowds, you go to expos, you're around people all the time. So all of those things might affect your risk. There's also some evidence that not all of those symptoms that are reported are actually caused by infection. It could be that they are caused by things like allergies, inflammation of the airways, because you're breathing for three, four hours very intensely, sometimes cold air. And so it might be that the event rather than the exercise is causing the risk. And we know, for instance, that people who go to Mecca every year, around 40% of them report infections and they're not exercising. So there is this element of social closening or coming together, the opposite of what we're all being asked to do right now. And then the final point, and I hate to break this to you, is that gyms are public spaces that involve a lot of touching, faces, equipment. And again, we're all experts now. We know that that's exactly what you don't want in order to contract or pick up an infection. So this was a study that was done by Mark Dalman's group where they went to various fitness centers in Ohio and they were looking for one bug, Staphylococcus aureus. And they found that 56% of the weight plates and 50% of treadmill handles would test positive for that bug. So you can see that being in a public space in close proximity, touching equipment, then face, next person, face, then equipment, that, that could very easily transmit a virus through a population. So the point is that exercise might be negatively infecting or affecting infection risk in two ways. 
Number one, shown here on this slide, is you might actually be at higher risk of exposure to pathogens. And number two, is that it might impair your ability to respond, as I showed you conceptually in that previous slide, where there's scientific evidence that your immune cells and function actually get suppressed by very hard, intense training. Practically, what does this mean for you? Not a huge amount, and, and the debate around which of these two models is causing it is, of course, important and interesting, but right now, not something you can change. All I would suggest is that you've got to think about the context and the environment in which you and your clients exercise, and you can only manage what you have control over. It's likely that both these factors are responsible for this J curve and this open window hypothesis. But what is it that you can manage? You can't really manage it right now. It's irrelevant what's happening in the public spaces because you can't access them anyway. But what you can manage is the intensity and sign of training. So that's what I want to summarize with. We know that moderate exercise and fitness are protective against infection. We also know that too little or too much may increase the risk. The theory is that that increased risk happens within an open window after very prolonged, intense and continuous exercise that shifts our bodies to an anti-inflammatory state, which makes us less able to mount our immune response to a challenge. And we also know that the environment and the context increase the risk because of the exposure. So taking that collectively, and this is where I'm going to wrap this one up, your responsibility in this time and in other times is to A, facilitate and encourage physical activity because it helps. B, find the sweet spot for intensity and duration for your clients or for yourself. And again, it's known that this risk of infection goes up after very intense, prolonged, and or continuous exercise. So training too hard for too long or too continuously seem to be the risk factors. If you are therefore conscious of the coronavirus and the risk of COVID-19, what you should be doing is training less intensely for shorter and think about doing interval type training instead of continuous. So for instance, if you have an hour available, instead of one hour solid at 75, 80% of VO2 max, consider 60% VO2 max, or go 90%, 50, 90, 50 in blocks of three to five minutes and train in that way to try and manage this risk factor profile of training. It's very important that you prioritize recovery and immune health when you're training hard. Now, this is probably not the time to be training hard and trying to improve performance. This is a time when you probably want to be sensible and prioritize health over performance. For those of you in severe lockdown, you can't really get out and train hard anyway. So this actually takes care of a, of a problem for you. But it's really important that if you do go out and train hard, those of you who are fortunate enough to have access to the outdoors, now's not the time to go out there and slay yourself and leave yourself lying on the side of the road at the end of a session exhausted. But if you're going to do that, recovery and immune health are absolutely critical. And the two things that matter are diet. It's known also that when you are in energy deficit, particularly for a prolonged period, there's a risk of immune dysfunction and suppression. So I would discourage you from doing low energy training at this time. Similarly, those of you who've got clients who are concerned about weight gain because they're not training as much as normal, now is not the time to go on a drastic diet where you cut down on energy intake or an entire food group. Rather keep your clients and your cells healthy and in balance and deal with those issues at some point in the future. And then finally, sleep. I know that being at home all the time has a major effect on your routines. It's disruptive. And some people have mentioned that they're finding that their sleep patterns are affected. Sleep hygiene, which is to say, put your cell phone off at eight o'clock at night. Don't look at it for two hours before bed. Go to bed at the same time as much as possible if you can. Wake up at the same time. Uh, think about diet in relation to sleep. Quiet rooms, temperature control in rooms. All those little things make a big deal, a big difference. And so therefore they are a big deal. So that's it in a nutshell. Now I'm not gonna give you too much practical advice. You're experts in exercise as personal trainers, but these are the concepts that you have to obey and implement 
in order to maximize the health of your clients and not necessarily their performance. I hope that's been enlightening. And if you are interested in continuing, the next phase of this talk, which will be part two, is on the physiology of detraining. What happens to fitness and performance and physiology when we cannot train the way we used to? So we're gonna get into that in part two, but for now I'm gonna call it on part one. So thanks for watching, and please join me in a moment for the second part.